travels in West Africa, Congo, Fran Francais, Corisco, and Cameroons by Mary H. Kingsley. To my brother, C. G. Kingsley, this book is dedicated. Preface. To the reader, what this book wants is not a simple preface, but an apology, and a very brilliant and convincing one at that. Recognizing this fully, and feeling quite incompetent to write such a masterpiece, I have asked several literary friends to write one for me, but they have kindly but firmly declined, stating that it is impossible satisfactorily to apologize for my liberties with Lindy, Linda, Lindy Murray and the Queen's English. I am therefore left to make a feeble apology for this book myself, and all I can personally say is that it would be, have been much worse than it had, than it is then it has i and i all i can say is personally that is that it would have been much worse than it is had it not been for dr henry gullimard who has not edited it or of course the whole affair would have been better but who has most kindly gone through the proof sheets lassoing prepositions which were straying outside their sentence stockade, taking my eyes off the water cask and fixing it on the scenery where I meant to be, saying firmly in pencil on margins, no you don't, when I was committing some more than unusual heinous literary crime, and so on. In cases where his activities in, this, in these things may seem to the reader to have been wanting, I beg to state that they were really were not. It is I who have, be, who have declined to ascend to a higher level of lucidity and correctness of diction than I am fitted for. I cannot forbear from mentioning my gratitude to Mr. George Macmillan for his patience and kindness to me, a mere jungle of information on West Africa. Whether you, my reader, will share my gratitude is, I fear, doubtful, for it is not being for him at, if were it not being for him, I should never have attempted to write a book at all. And, in order to excuse his having induced me to try, I beg to state that I have written only on things that I know from personal experience and very careful observation. I have never accepted an explanation of a native custom from one person alone, nor have I set down things as being prevalent customs from having seen a single instance. I have endeavored to give you an honest account of the general state and manner of life in Lower Guinea, and some descriptions of the various types of country there. In reading this section, you must make allowances for my love of this sort of country, with its great forests and rivers and its animalistic-minded, animistic-minded inhabitants, and for my ability to be more comfortable there than in England. Your superior culture instincts may militate against your enjoying West Africa, but if you go there, you will find things as I have said. January 1987 Preface to the abridged edition of Travels in West Africa When on my return to England from my second sojourn to, in West Africa, I discovered to my alarm that I was, by freak of fate, the sea serpent of the season, I published, in order to escape from this reputation, a very condensed, much abridged version of my experiences in Lower Guinea, and I thought that I need never explain about myself or Lower Guinea again. This was one of my errors. I have been explaining ever since, and, though not reconciled to do so, I am more or less resigned to it because it gives me pleasure to see that English people can take an interest in that land they have neglected. Nevertheless, it was a shock to me when the publisher said more explanation was required. I am thankful to say that the explanation they required was merely on what plan the abridgment of my first account had been made. I can manage that explanation easily. It has been done by removing from it certain sections whole and leaving the rest very much as it first stood. Of course, it would have been better if I had, to if I had totally reformed and rewritten the book in lucid English, but that is beyond me, and I feel at any rate this book must be better than it was, for there is less of it, and I dimly hope critics will now see that there is a saving grace in disconnectedness, for, allowing to that disconnectedness, whole chapters have come out with leaving holes. As for the parts that that is left in, I have already apologized for its form, and cannot help it, for Lower Guinea is alike what I have said it is, 
No one who knows it has sent home contradictions of my description of it, or its natives, or their manners or customs, and they have had by now ample time and opportunity. The only complaints I have had regarding my account from my fellow West Coasters have been that I might have said more. I trust my forbearance will send a thrill of gratitude through readers of the 736 page edition. There is, however, one section that I reprint, regarding which I must say a few words. It is that on the trade and labor problem in West Africa, particularly the opinion therein expressed regarding the liquor traffic. This part has brought down on me much criticism from the missionary societies and their friends, and I beg gratefully to acknowledge their honorable fairness with which the controversy has been carried on by the great Willisian Methodist Mission to the Gold Coast and the Baptist Mission to the Congo. It is not ended in our agreement on this point, but it has raised my esteem of missionary societies considerably, and anyone interested in this matter, I beg refer to the Baptist Magazine for October 1897. Therein will be found my answer, and the comments on it, by a competent missionary authority. For the rest of this matter, I beg all readers of this book to bear in mind that I confine myself to speaking only of only of the bits of Africa I know, West Africa. During this past summer, I attended a meeting at which Sir George T Tobman Goldie spoke, and was much struck with the truth of what he said on the difference of different African regions. He divided Africa into three zones. Firstly, that region where white r races could colonize in the true sense of the word, and form a great native-born white population, namely the region of the Cape, Secondly, a region where the white race would colonize, but to a less extent, an extent analogous to that in India, namely the highlands of Central East Africa and parts of Northern Africa. Thirdly, a region where the white races cannot colonize in a true sense of the word, namely the West Africa region. And in those regions, he pointed out, one of the main elements of prosperity and advance is the native African population. I am quoting his words from memory, possibly imperfectly, but there is very little reliable printed matter on which to go when dealing with Sir George Taubman Gold Goldie, which is regrettable, because he himself is an experienced and reliable authority. I am, however, quite convinced that these aforesaid distinct regions are regions that the practical politician dealing with Africa must recognize and keep constantly in mind when attempting to solve the many difficulties that the great continent presents, and sincerely hope every reader of this work will remember that I am speaking of this last zone, the zone wherein white races cannot colonize in a true sense of the word but which is nevertheless a vitally import important region to a great manufacturing country like England, for therein are vast undeveloped markets wherein she can sell her manufactured goods and purchase raw material for her manufacturers at a reasonable rate.